What I'd like to talk now about is uh, the higher education sector in Pakistan and uh, what the issues are and uh, what we have tried to do in the period between 2002 and 2008 when I was the chairman of the Higher Education Commission. The main problem that we face in our universities is that of the quality of education. This has been dismal and with a few exceptions where there are some uh, good centers, by and large the quality has been weak. And the reason for that has been largely because of the quality of faculty within the universities. In our universities we have about 17,500 faculty members of which only about 3,500 had PhD degrees and out of those 3,500 only about a few hundred were publishing at an international level. Now there is a fundamental difference between a college and a university which needs to be understood. College is largely about transfer of existing knowledge. A university has an additional important function which is the creation of new knowledge and the new universities are judged in this day and age be it the Shanghai system of ranking of universities or the Higher Education Times UK system of ranking of universities or be it the German system of ranking of universities. They are judged in this day and age by the creative potential of those universities, the creative output of those universities through research publications in leading international journals, through the PhD output from their institutions through the honors and awards won there by, by their faculty uh, at an international level, through the impact factors of journals. This, this is a ranking system which is published by the Institute of Scientific Information in Philadelphia, USA. This is a numerical ranking system of journals which the higher the numerical ranking, the, the more prestigious the journal. So these are called impact factors. So impact factors of international journals and by the citations, the number of times the work of Pakistani academicians is cited by others at an international level. This again is published in the, by the Institute of Scientific Information in Philadelphia, USA. Not just in sciences but also in social sciences for the social science journals and so through the science citation index. So these are all criteria which l are linked to research, to creativity and hence to the quality of faculty uh, in those universities. In the year 2000, Pakistan did not have a single university ranked in the top 600 of the world. Today, in the last rankings which came out in November 2009, in natural sciences, Karachi University is ranked at 223 in the world. National University of Science and Technology is ranked at 260, 260 in the world in natural sciences and the Qaeda Azam University in Islamabad is ranked at 270 in the world in natural sciences. Overall, NAST National University of Science and Technology is ranked at 350 in the world. Now these are very respectable rankings when you look at that just six years ago or seven years ago there was not a single university anywhere in the international rankings. So what has led to this sudden transformation in our universities and this change in rankings made not by us in Pakistan but by the Higher Education Times UK which ranks all world universities in, and these are internationally respected and accepted rankings. The reason behind this change has been multifold but the most important has been the efforts made, made by the Higher Education Commission to promote research in our universities. There are three major challenges in the higher education sector. Quality of education and these challenges also apply as well to the middle and lower level sectors of our education. So quality of education. The second challenge is access. What percentage of our children have access to edu higher education? It was 2.3 percent only of the age groups between 17 years and 23 years in the year 2002. Now uh, it has risen from 2.3 percent to 5.1 percent. Still very low. India which has a much bigger population than ours is at about 10 percent and would you believe it Korea 
is at 82%. 82% of their young men and women between the ages of 17 to 23 are benefiting from higher education. While we, in spite of the significant increase over the last six years, are now at still at a very low 5.1%. More than doubled, but still very low. So this is the first challenge, access. We need to expand this base, because at the moment for every 10 students who come out of high school, only one or less has the chance of getting into universities, because there are too few of them. The number of universities has, however, increased over the last eight years. We had only about 58 universities in the year 2000. Now there are 127 universities and degree awarding institutes. So it's more than doubled. There were, there were only 135,000 students obtaining higher education in the year 2000. Today it is 400,000 students enrolled in higher education. So it's almost tripled. There were only about 85 or 90,000 students benefiting from distance education, distance learning in the year 2000. Now there are about 560,000 students, six-fold growth. Pakistan used to publish only about a few hundred papers in the year. There were about 600 or so papers being published in the year 2000 in international journals. Now there are more than 4,000 papers coming out in international journals every year, about 600% growth in research publication. The citations, how many times is our work being cited by others? There's been between 800 to 1,000 percent growth in the number of citations. And these are all numbers which cannot be denied. They are facts that anybody can look up. And the fact that we have these international rankings can also be looked up by anybody. They just have to go to the website of the Institute of Scientific Information and see what the rankings are. So what has led to these rapid changes which have no parallel in the world in any developing country? Brazil has made very significant progress in higher education. And I was looking at the exact figures that the Brazilian Minister of Science and Technology presented at a Royal Society meeting in London uh, last year. I happened to be a fellow of the Royal Society, and I, I was there. And the changes that he showed from Brazil uh, research output rising from about 500 publications to about 4,000 publications in mid-1990s took 40 years, from 1950 to 1990. It took about 40 years for Brazil to achieve the increase in research output that Pakistan achieved in a matter of six or seven years. So what was this, what led to this transformation? And what kind of things did we do to make it happen? The first thing that we said was that Universities are not built by m m building beautiful buildings, as you see plenty of palaces which are scattered about in the Middle East, whether it is Dubai, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. They have created huge, rather monstrous, if I may say so, palaces, which have very little creative potential. Paperless environments, you go there, they proudly show all the gadgets that they have. But if you look at creative output, it is almost zero in most of these countries. And, in, and so there's a huge amount of expenditure without results. So the key for progress in our universities is quality faculty. And so we decided in 2002, 2003, that if Pakistan is going to improve in its higher education sector, it has to be on the strength of its brightest young men and women. We have to put most of our money in educating them. First of all, identifying them strictly on merit. So, and we have no shortage of creative potential. There are 85 million below the age of 19 in Pakistan in a population of some 160 million. So 54 or 55% of the population of Pakistan is below 19. And within this population, there are surely tens of thousands of Einsteins and Newtons and Ibn Sinas and Albirunis and others. We have, what we have to do is to discover them in a transparent, competitive manner, and then provide them with opportunities to uh, go to the best universities from across the world. 
and uh, uh, get training there and then create an, an enabling environment so that they come back and contribute to the development of Pakistan rather than looking at greener pastures elsewhere and remaining abroad. And this environment has to be such which, which will address their basic concerns, which will be access to research facilities, access to books and journals, a critical mass of, of uh, faculty members who can work together and form teams, uh, good salary structures so that they would uh, not to have look, they would not need to look elsewhere and they would be able to uh, get a good salary and uh, access to uh, good research grants which are so a system which would offer them without actually applying to international sources within Pakistan access to research grants these are the key factors I've been a professor of chemistry all my life, and I have lived uh, in Karachi most of my life. I was, uh, I've contributed to the development of the HEJ Research Institute of Chemistry, which has some 350 students uh, doing PhD, and I've had about 120 German students who have come to study chemistry in my center over the last six years. So it can be done, and so I went and became the chairman of the Higher Education Commission. Uh, with this background of a, uh, of a researcher, I've been in this field for many years, and I've suffered from the pangs of uh, need uh, for support for my research work, whether it was scientific instrumentation or whether it was access to journals. And uh, I have fought it out over the years uh, with a determination, and alhamdulillah, uh, God has been very kind, and we have been able to uh, make it to a certain level of excellence. So the key is quality faculty. And so we therefore devised a system where we said we will identify the brightest sparks that we have uh, in our country. Uh, firstly, through a process of shortlisting on, on their past academic careers. So that is the first cut. Second, we will have a national examination every two or three months where we'll, we will do a second cut. And so every, every three months, an examination is held in which some 12 to 15,000 students appear. And the best 500 are then shortlisted. The best performing 500 are shortlisted. So this is the second cut. And the, both these are very transparent. They are based on merit. And the third cut I said, which involves physical interviews and final selection, no one in the government should be involved in that. So because you know, of, of various influences that are brought up, uh, the so-and-so minister or the prime minister or the president wants to send his nephew or a niece or grandson or grandchild, and, and, and so various slips of paper come. Uh, so it will have to be a very merit-based system. And so we devised a, uh, a method whereby the final selection was done by the foreign professors. And so if students are going to Germany, a team of five or six German professors would come to Pakistan, go to Lahore, Karachi, Islamabad, and other cities, and hold personal interviews and do the selection. The same for other countries. And if for some reason they couldn't come, then these, inter these interviews were organized through video conferencing. Uh, but everybody was interviewed. So this was. And on this basis, the students were sent. And you'd be pleased to learn that the majority of students who were selected came from poor families who did not have a hope of ever going abroad to such top places uh, across the world. And we, uh, we initiated the world's largest Fulbright program uh, for 640 students, which is half funded by USAID and half by the Higher Education Commission. Uh, we insisted on providing half the funds. And that was because we wanted to have a certain level of control a, of the fields in which the students are being sent so that they should be linked to the needs of Pakistan and to the process of socioeconomic development. So we didn't want five, 600 people coming back with PhDs in American literature, for instance, although, of course, I have nothing against American literature. So there, it, has to be, it had to be uh, linked to the process of uh, our needs and our development, and also to the institutions we they ascend. In the US, for instance, there are some very low quality institutions as well. So we insisted that these should be Ivy League universities only. 
and 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 so we went for quality uh, and not just numbers uh, besides this we identified the top institutions in germany in france in italy in sweden in uk also and uh, we uh, and so uh, some 5000 students uh, were sent abroad about a crore of rupees was being spent on each student so this was a 50 billion rupee 50 arab rupee ka 50 billion rupee program and 60% of the funds of the higher education commission was spent on just this scholarship program and this i think is the best money that we could have spent on our children uh, on our brightest children through a merit based selection process and uh, they now in order for them to attract them back in order for us to attract them back we had to create that enabling environment so that they would want to come back so for instance they must have books and journals if they want to come back because they have come back they would like to do research and in order for research they must have access to the literature they must have access to instrumentation they must have access to research grants and they must have good salaries uh, so that they are comfortable so for to for access to lit literature uh, i was previously the minister of science and technology and also of it and telecom this was for a two and a half year stint uh, when i was uh, when i was selected by president musharraf at the time to head this ministry of science and technology and it and telecom division and science and technology division were under the some same uh, umbrella under the same minister and at that time i had tried in those two years or two and a half years that i had to create an enabling environment by rapidly spreading internet which spread from 29 cities to about a thousand town cities and villages in a matter of two years and i must acknowledge the support and guidance that i got received from mr salman ansari at the time who was my it advisor and who helped who helped me in formulating the it policy uh, we went from 40 cities which had fiber to several hundred cities which had fiber the prices of bandwidth were $87,000 a month for a 2 megabit line we brought them down at that time to three and a half thousand dollars per month for a 2 megabit line and we also triggered the telecommunication boom because at that time you had to pay for receiving a telephone call and people were rel reluctant to have mobile phones because somebody else was calling and it was the money was being paid from their pocket so we brought in the calling party pays regime and we placed Pakistan's first satellite ParkSat 1 in space uh, which we acquired only for f only four million dollars would you believe it now they are trying to acquire a new one for 400 million dollars and the one that we had acquired at the time is still running beautifully most of your television programs are uh, now shown on Paxat one we had brought in, in brought it in primarily for education and also for strategic reasons because we had five slots in space we had lost four of them this was the last one and if we hadn't had a satellite working by the end of 2002 then India, Israel or any other country could have pushed their satellite up at 38 degrees east where the satellite is. So, and so we, we brought it as in as an educational satellite and get, set aside a number of channels for the virtual university which I had also established at that time which is I'm glad to say uh, running beautifully under the able leadership of uh, Dr. Naveed Malik. So, so having contributed to the development of this infrastructure, IT infrastructure in Pakistan uh, when I became the federal minister and, and chairman of the higher education commission I could then benefit th from this infrastructure by linking up universities we started the PERN project Pakistan educational research network which benefited directly from this infrastructure and uh, this project provided high-speed internet access to various universities and on this platform we could then launch our digital library which uh, provides some 25,000 international journals with all back volumes to every public sector university in Pakistan and to most private sector universities also. It provides 45,000 textbooks from 220 international publishers to all students in every public sector university. These are keyword searchable and downloadable on this platform we could also then have our video conferencing facilities which are now available in 
all universities so that lectures could be delivered uh, through distance learning from across the world, which could be listened to live and interactively uh, in Pakistan. And some 200 lectures were organized by top professors from across the world. This IT infrastructure uh, was then upgraded to the second phase, the PERN 2 program, uh, under which uh, we have one gigabit connectivity going to the universities, and these linked to 10 gig gigabit loops around major cities of Pakistan. And so this is an ongoing phase, uh, the, the PERN 2 upgradation to the, uh, to the higher band bandwidth speeds. Uh, besides access to the literature, which became available uh, very easily to everybody, since there were various publishers and you had to go to different websites of different publishers to download the journals, we collaborated with the University of Lund in Sweden to develop a one window uh, search engine so that the uh, students did not have to look at different websites of different publishers. They could just access all these 25,000 international journals just through uh, one window search. And this became operative also. So this was uh, one important facet of creating the enabling environment that was then later used by researchers in Pakistan and is also uh, very necessary for trained faculty members coming from foreign universities after their doctorate degrees. The second was access to research grants. Now it was important that uh, these students who are coming back with the PhD degrees can start running with the ball as soon as they come back. In other words, they should have a, a grant available uh, so that they can buy equipment, chemicals, consumables, books, journals according to their needs. And so we st started a program uh, under which each student could apply for a grant of up to $100,000. It was 6 million rupees at the time, uh, 60 lakhs of rupees, one year before he was due to return. So that the process of peer review, etc., was conducted and uh, well in time. And the project would then be ready for him uh, to get funds from immediately on his returning to Pakistan. We did make a one, one condition in this, that uh, there should be some collaboration with a foreign professor. It could be your supervisor, it could be another colleague. I was and am interested that we should have a network of strong linkages with the best foreign institutions. And this condition meant that there were potentially four or 5,000 international linkages uh, which could be formed through these four or 5,000 research grants. So this is uh, uh, a program that is still uh, available to students and many students who have, have won uh, grants, there are several in my institution in Karachi, who have won these research grants and have be benefited considerably from them. And these are in, uh, with some collaborations with their foreign professors. Uh, so access to research grants. Access to sophisticated instrumentation was, is also a key aspect of conducting research. Now we cannot have everything everywhere because of the limitations of funds. Some equipments can cost several crores of rupees and you can't buy such equipments in every laboratory in the country. So we found a creative way around this problem and we said any faculty member in Pakistan can send his samples to an, for analysis to any institution of his choice in the country. This analysis would be done for him immediately and would be free of charge so that he won't have to pay a penny for it. However, the institution which is providing the analysis will generate a bill which will be sent to the Higher Education Commission for payment. So this was an excellent way to optimize the existing equipment which we had in Pakistan. And in many laboratories across the country, you have a lot of expensive equipment lying unused or sometimes out of order because there's not enough demand for it. It has been acquired and just kept there, but it's not used. So this allowed uh, all the equipment uh, or a lot of equipment that we had in Pakistan to be optimally used at zero cost to the researchers across Pakistan. And uh, we identified networks of laboratories across the country who had excellent facilities and, uh, and we placed the information about them on the website. So this was to for providing access to instrumentation. Then in order to facilitate these students, uh, we had to make sure they had jobs to come back to. 
one of the problems in the past has been that students are sent abroad on government scholarships, but when they come back, they find that there's a lot of lethargy. The universities say, oh yes, we are interested, but we'd have to advertise and select you on merit. And they sort of wander around frustrated for eight months, 12 months, sometimes more than a year without having a job. And finally, they give up and say, well, this country doesn't need us. And they go back to uh, Europe or USA or wherever. And this is a huge loss uh, of excellent talent. And I said, we must somehow find a way to solve this problem. So I said, let's create a buffer one year period when from the moment they land, they will have a job on the, uh, on the new higher salary structure, tenure track system, which I will talk about in a, in a minute, uh, so that they are not looking for a job. We will do a matchmaking uh, after uh, sending their uh, CV and their publications and the title of their thesis to various universities, HEC will carry out, carry out the job of matchmaking and get expressions of interest from different universities. And then we will place them in different institutions after when both sides agreed, the, the scholar and the university agreed that they wanted to work at, at that institution. So I said, this is too important a program for anyone else to handle. So I said, this is a program that I will handle myself. And so I was directly looking after the placement of these students uh, in various universities and arranging jobs for them uh, six months or a year in advance of their return. And in the meantime, they were coming back as HEC scholars because the universities, of course, have to follow their own rules and regulations by advertising uh, for the positions and then selecting for faculty positions on merit. And, uh, so this allowed returning scholars to be placed in universities without any heartaches that they would otherwise face. So this allowed the students to be placed in different institutions without going through the heartaches of coming back and looking for jobs and, fi and finding it very frustrating. They don't know where they are going to make it. So uh, this was the third. Uh, the, the next aspect. Then they had to, we, we had to arrange good salaries for them. And uh, this was perhaps the hardest nut to crack. And uh, how do you uh, address this problem? Bureaucracy would not normally agree to change salary structures. So what we had done was uh, to form a chancellor's committee. Uh, this comprised the president of Pakistan, who, was, who is the chancellor of the federal universities, the prime minister of Pakistan, who is also the chancellor of some federal universities, uh, all the four governors, who are the chancellors of all the provincial universities, the deputy chairman planning commission, the finance minister by invitation, and the chairman of the higher education commission, which was myself at the time. And we also inducted the chief ministers of all the provinces uh, by invitation. And this became a high-powered body with the president, prime minister, governors, and chief ministers, as well as the man with the money bag, the finance minister, <laughs> as a part of this. And we, we then took such difficult decisions, and we fought it out at that level and got agreements at that level. So uh, in a presentation that I made at the Chancellor's Committee, I pleaded for increasing of salaries and the grounds that I used in my argument was that the brightest children who pass out of high school from Pakistan, whether it's inter or whether it is A-levels, how many of them go into serious medical research, stem cells, or into biotechnology, or into nanotechnology, or into the various uh, other fascinating branches of science, or into uh, social sciences. Uh, most of them opt for two or three paths. They want to become a medical doctor or an engineer, or some of them from industrialist families go into business administration. But hardly any of them go into the hundred other avenues uh, which may interest them, but which they do not feel uh, are appropriate because there are no career structures for them. So I said, let's change this. And we would like to have a different system of appointments in our universities which we call the tenure track system, in which the salaries of uh, a professor 
should be about four to five times the salary of a federal minister in the government. Four to five times the salary of a federal minister in the government. So that they could see, okay, I, I, am, uh, I want to do music, I want to teach music in the university. However, I can have an excellent salary structure provided the quality is there. So there was a strong conditionality. And the conditionality was this, that they would be appointed on contract for the first three years and then there would be an international panel of experts in that field located in the technologically advanced countries and this panel of experts would then assess their output and then decide if the, their work is of an appropriate standard or not of top international uh, standards or not and if it is then they will be extended for another three years if not their contract will be terminated and they'll be uh, then uh, they can do something else because we said universities are a place for creative manpower and if and so we built in this system and then after the and once their contract was extended for another three years this review process would again take place uh, after six years from the original appointment that is after another three year period and so there will be two international independent assessments by panels of experts in technologically advanced countries. Because we, fe we felt that it was no point in increasing salaries of, uh, of people who are substandard and uh, they had to have this external review process in order to win tenure in the universities. Initially there was some resistance from universities and there were some of them were slow but now the vast majority of universities adopted this system and so the new induction in these universities are taking place on this new tenure track system. So we said for a certain period of time both systems will run in parallel. There will be the old system of existing faculty members and the new system where new induction will take place on this higher salary structure. However if the existing faculty members also feel that they are very good and they are willing to be assessed and work on contract, then they can give up their old system and move to this new system. So this option was given. As a result, about six to seven percent of faculty members in our universities have opted for this new system, but all new inductions are taking place in all these universities which have adopted the tenure track system onto this new system, and so the old system is being gradually phased out. So the higher salary structures were created but linked to performance assessment. This was a major step forward and these various initiatives that I am talking about, access to research grants, better salaries, improved infrastructure, access to instrumentation, raised concerns in India, you may be interested to note. And uh, in June 2006, there was uh, an article published in the Hindustan Times which uh, was headed Park Threat to Indian Science and it talked about these initiatives that I had taken and how including higher salary structures and other measures and it said that if this was a presentation made by Professor C. N. R. Rao who is the advisor to the Indian Prime Minister on Science and Technology and who is a, a very eminent uh, scientist on his own right. He was previously the head of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and was also at one time the president of the Third World Academy of Sciences which was founded by Professor Abdus Salam. So he made this pre presentation to the Indian Prime Minister talking about the programs that Pakistan had undertaken and saying that India should not, must not be left behind, they must wake up to what something quite dramatic which is taking place in Pakistan. Of course he had nothing to worry about because in my opinion India has been way ahead in education at all levels including higher education as compared to Pakistan. Their IITs are amongst the best institutions in the world and uh, yet they became very concerned. And as a result, uh, some of the policies that we had undertaken including the establishment of foreign universities in Pakistan, including the raising of salary structures, they have tripled the salary structures uh, during the current budget, uh, including the raises of funds to the higher education sector including the doubling of the IITs, doubling the number of IITs in India and setting up uh, a large number of new Indian institutes of science. These are all things which, have, which are, are taking place right now which are in some cases emulating what we, have, we, we had done in Pakistan. 
well, the best of luck to them. This is something that uh, each of our countries must uh, do according to our needs. So these initiatives that we had taken uh, included access to research grants, and we created a very large research fund within the auspices of the Higher Education Commission. And this research fund, we invited faculty members in different universities. Many of these were good people who had been in universities for a long time, but had, deeply, but had been deeply frustrated because of lack of any support for research. And many had, had almost given up. They had done very little research for a long time. So this was like a breath of fresh air. And they could then apply for research grants to, and then win research grants. Of course, each project was looked at very carefully through a strong peer review. And so research funds were not easily uh, dispensed with. But those who could qualify after the peer review process were given ample research funding, which led to the 600% increase in research publications and over a 1,000% increase in citations within a matter of six or seven years that I talked about earlier. Another aspect which was extremely important in the higher education sector was to build in within the curricula innovation and entrepreneurship so that students could get no, the students I feel who come out from my universities must not be just job seekers. They must be job providers, which means that a student who comes out should have the courage and the knowledge to form a company uh, and to start his own institution uh, without worrying about other aspects. But for that, you need ability, you need competence, you need knowledge, you need training. And so within the universities, we introduced courses on innovation and entrepreneurship. We linked up with professors in the State University of New York and in other universities uh, to provide uh, uh, the help in development of curricula and also in, in teaching exercises. And talking of curricula, uh, we felt that there was a major revision needed in all the curricula in our universities. Some curricula, for instance, the medical curricula, had not been revised for 30 years. And God knows what kind of medical doctors we have been producing. So we said this must, they must be regularly revised once every three years. At least they must be looked at again. And we should get the end users of the students, who are the employers of the students, involved in the, uh, in the formulation of the curricula. So the representatives of business communities, industries, relevant industries, and the private sector was therefore inducted and 105 curricula were revised. Uh, and a second revision of curricula was initiated, which I believe has been completed. And the third is now underway. This was completed after I left. And the third is now underway. So, uh, and they were modernized uh, with the emphasis on problem solving skills, not on just learning facts and reproducing them, but on problem solving skills, which I talked about uh, at the very beginning. So these uh, initiatives that we took led to a huge growth in research output uh, from Pakistan. Uh, it led to a significant growth in the PhD output, which started growing by about 50% each year uh, from year to year. Uh, it was only a couple of hundred PhDs. Now it is more than 700 PhDs are produced by Pakistani universities. But then we previously, there was no requirement uh, at the national level for PhDs to be assessed by foreign experts. So PhD thesis used to go uh, normally, except in, a, in, the, in the case of a few universities, to colleagues within Pakistan and be assessed within Pakistan. So we said, no, uh, all PhD thesis must be assessed by two experts in technologically advanced countries. And only when they both concur that the work is of high international standards should the Viva Vose examination be held. We also introduced uh, that there should be a GRE examination that the student should take. And that brought in a lot of criticism. Why should there be a need of GRE for uh, students? But we said no. And we, uh, so uh, in various institutions, at various level, in my institution, in HEJ, students have to score above 60 percentile marks in order for to, before they can actually go into a PhD program. And usually this is done in the first two years when they're being enrolled for MPhil. And many students are scoring 70, 80 percentile. And one girl that I interviewed had above 90 percentile last week. 
which he scored. And uh, we are now raising the barrier. Next year, we plan to increase the minimum uh, percentile to 70 in my center. In other institutions, it is lower, but it is a requirement. We have, in my center, we have also made it uh, mandatory for the faculty to be passed through a GRE examination. <laughs> this is for the young faculty members with PhD degrees. We said, if you can't pass a GRE with good marks, then uh, there is no room for you in my center. And so uh, we find the, uh, these professors having PhD degrees studying the basics once again, which is, I think, good for, uh, for them. Uh, that they should uh, at least have the command on the very, very important basic things in each subject. Th our emphasis on international linkages was of critical importance. And besides these students who are coming back, we said we have to develop our own set of linkages with international institutions. And uh, so we joined hands with the British Council which has acted as a facilitator. And some 50 linkages, 5-0 linkages, have been established with British universities with the funding coming entirely from the Higher Education Commission. Similarly, there are a large number of programs in which strong collaborations are going on with various US universities as well, uh, as well as with other uh, European universities, so international linkages. We also supported the development of specialized fields in different parts of Pakistan. For instance, uh, we set up an earthquake research center uh, at the, in Peshawar. Uh, this was before we had this massive earthquake and people were questioning why do you need an earthquake research center. We have never heard, had a major earthquake here, at least in the last several decades. And uh, so that came in very useful at that time. And uh, the Center of Excellence in Geology in Peshawar was supported in a major way as were centers of biotechnology in Lahore and uh, other centers across the country. But basically, perhaps the most, uh, primarily the most important thing that has happened is that young men and women became excited about possibilities of good career structures uh, in, high, in the higher education sector. And uh, our programs were not just tailored for the universities, because the students were, who were being sent abroad uh, also, uh, they could come from anywhere. So this was the student out in the street. I said this is not a program tailored to the improvement of qualifications of our existing faculty members. If there are bright faculty members in our existing universities, let them compete with everybody else and win a scholarship for a PhD on merit. So there was no, we didn't start programs under the HEC umbrella, though some universities had some projects for improvement of their own faculty members. But most of the scholarships that were given under the HEC programs were for a person working anywhere in any institution in the country. And uh, so many persons from PCSIR or from the Kahuta Research Laboratories or from NESCOM or the Pakistan Agricultural Research Council and from other national organizations benefited and are benefit benefiting from the HEC programs, although in the last year or so, I'm sorry to say that the program has dried up because of shortage of funds. Uh, this year, there was an amount of 22 billion rupees allocated in the budget of the higher education sector, but only 11 billion rupees have been released so far. Uh, and uh, it looks as if there will be a 50% cut in the budget for the higher education sector. And, and this has resulted in the freezing of some 250 projects of the Higher Education Commission. And many programs and projects which had been undertaken by the universities, uh, many buildings are now half built, but the money is not there. There are many suits, uh, legal suits being, being filed by contractors uh, on the universities for, for payment. And so it's a, it's a dire need for intervention by the government to remedy this situation. So this aspect of uh, A, creating the faculty, B, creating the infrastructure, C, providing jobs, good jobs uh, in suitable institutions, and D, uh, providing good salaries to these people who are coming back, and, and E, access to research grants. Uh, uh, all these combined to create the enabling environment in the higher education sector, uh, which has improved considerably. There are still many shortcomings but it has improved considerably as compared to what it was uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Now, as a result of what I was trying to do, it's always 
difficult when you try to when you're trying to bring about a change. Uh, there is resistance, and people are not happy uh, when new ideas and new processes and new measures for measurement of the creative output and new measures for promotion of faculty. For instance, we toughened the criteria for appointment of faculty members or promotion of faculty members. And so there was some resistance initially. But uh, by the time I had left, there was virtually unanimity of opinion that something wonderful had happened in Pakistan, except for one or two critics who keep writing in national presses. But by and large, generally, there was strong support in my opinion, it is not important of what I say or what my colleagues say about what's happening or what some of the critics may say. What matters are the statistics. And what matters is the international opinion. Statistics, I've already pointed out that five of Pakistan's universities are ranked now amongst the top 600 of the world. We have in natural sciences rankings of 223, 260, 270 in the world, which I've spoken about. And there have been detailed articles written by neutral international and very eminent uh, international experts. One of them, which was written, and you can have the links for these articles, was by Professor Michael Rode, who was the president of the, of the United Nations Commission on Science, Technology, and Development. And he's now heading an organization which comprises the universities of, in Europe and universities in Asia. It's called Asia Uninet. It's a network which he's heading. He's at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. Another very detailed article was written by Professor Wolfgang Falter. Uh, both of these gentlemen have got civil awards for their contributions to the development of higher education in Pakistan. Professor Michael Rode was given a Sitarai Pakistan on 23rd of March this year. Professor Folter has got two civil awards, Sitara and Hidale Pakistan, for their contributions to Pakistan. And both of them have been full of praise at this tremendous change and this silent revolution that has taken place. A third article is by Professor Fred Hayward, who is uh, an expert, uh, an independent US consultant, initially hired by USAID for looking at Pakistan. And USAID pro produced a detailed report on what Pakistan had done. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it was full of praise again, and this and this gentleman, Professor Fred Hayward, has written a separate article in the Higher Education Chronicles, published in USA, and you can have a link to that of his views of what has happened in Pakistan. More interestingly, there have been three editorials which have come out in the world's top science journal, Nature. These editorials uh, praise what is going on in Pakistan. In one editorial, ent entitled the paradox of Pakistan. It said that uh, we have this strange country where on the one hand you have terrorism and all these bombings and explosions and so on. And on the other hand, you have this exciting program in higher education, which and it talked about me and what we had been doing. So this is the paradox that in this country you have these two faces of the same coin. In another article, it talked about the editorial mentioned the, it was entitled After Musharraf. And it then exp expressed concerns and said, it, we must not go back to the Stone Age. This is nature editorial. We must not go back to the Stone Age, which existed before the higher education came into being and all these programs were initiated. But it's important to continue to support and follow the same path. More recently, there was a detailed article in the editorial which gave figures that I've just described about the increase in citation. And, 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 this is, and, and it said it, this is an example for other developing co countries to learn from what Pakistan has achieved uh, in this sector. So I think this is what matters in the final analysis, what the world is saying about Pakistan, and the need to continue on this path uh, of knowledge, and also to link it with the process of industrial development, so that whatever the higher education sector is doing is, then has an impact on the quality of agriculture, on the quality of industries that we have, and, uh, and in the development of new products and processes. Uh, in this connection, the Higher Education Commission had set up a, a separate fund uh, where, to which universities and academia could apply together. So it, had to be, it has to be a joint application. 
in which at least 20% money should come from industries. Up to 80% will be provided for the government, for, from the government, uh, which is HEC, uh, to, to address problems faced by industries. So it was a fund to link academia and industry together with major funding coming in from the government uh, so that the projects undertaken by universities or by many institutions in universities should be much more relevant to the needs of the society. And this has worked well. There are many projects which have been funded which are of an applied nature and which are addressing industrial problems which have been funded through this fund which we established under the umbrella of the Higher Education Commission. A special emphasis was given to quality of education and to curb the menace of plagiarism. Plagiarism has been going on in our universities uh, for many decades and it has never been curbed till the Higher Education Commission came in. And what we did was we acquired a software which was at that time called Authenticate and now it's called Turnitin. And we made this available to universities and also created a cell within the Higher Education Commission so that, so that all theses coming out, there is a repository created within the HEC and all theses are then assessed through the software. And they are also uh, all research publications are also assessed through the software and any f uh, paper which has been copied from the work of others can be then caught in a matter of uh, minutes. This led to the detection of uh, plagiarism in many universities and strict action was taken uh, against one professor who was, who had to be, was HEC forced the university to remove him. Uh, in the International Islamic University and also a case was detected in Punjab University where five professors of physics had copied the work of the director of, of CERN, an institution located in Geneva which is, uh, which has one of the f a fantastic experiment going on in Geneva some 20. So this uh, software that we had distributed and which was available in HEC allowed the detection of plagiarism in Punjab University where five professors in the physics department uh, had copied the work of the director of CERN in Geneva and published it as their own. Initially the university had difficulties in removing them. The case was pending with the governor of Punjab for almost a year. Uh, HEC decided to take stiff action and we blocked the funds of Punjab University. We said we will not release development funds as these people are obviously guilty and the university is bowing to political pressures. Finally, the governor took action and these people were fired. Similarly, there were other cases which have been detected and so the menace of uh, plagiarism has largely been eliminated from Pakistan. And uh, this was important to do. Similarly, to ensure quality, we set up a quality assurance cell within the Higher Education Commission. And also in different universities, we established quality assurance cells because most universities were not familiar of how do you assess quality of education within a university. What kind of format of assessment does one go through? How do you do an internal assessment? What is done externally to look at uh, the quality of education, the quality of uh, the, the man manner in which teaching is being done, the manner in which examination papers are being framed and assessed. And there is a, it's quite a complex thing. So the whole works uh, were established in different universities and quality assurance cells were established and this required a training phase also of the university faculty members uh, and this has helped to improve quality uh, with special training programs being initiated within the Higher Education Commission. Also in areas like communication skills there were courses ranging from three months to a week which uh, were organized uh, within the Higher Education Commission and are still organized to bring the faculty up to the frontiers or to provide them with more in-depth knowledge for longer courses in different fields including English courses and, and, uh, and other areas. So there has been a huge program, a multifaceted program initiated under the auspices of the Higher Education Commission and this program has started yielding excellent results. Uh, it needs to be understood that the Higher Education Commission does not have legal powers 
to intervene in the functioning of universities. We have financial powers uh, in terms of how much money we can release, but we universities are all completely autonomous bodies which are run under their own syndicates and their own senates. And often people come to the HEC and say, why don't you do this in this university? In fact, uh, some people say, why doesn't HEC take action against the parliamentarians in respect of their fake, fake degrees? Uh, they don't understand that HEC has no legal powers. All it can do is to act if uh, the government takes a decision that their degrees have to be assessed by HEC, which it has taken now, and these degrees are being assessed, in the but it cannot initiate legally action against parliamentarians or for that matter against the professors in universities. These such actions must be taken by the universities themselves and HEC is just primarily a body which looks at quality assurance and there are certain set dimensions in which it can or cannot act. And uh, uh, within those dimensions, I believe it has been ex an excellent model of success as it reports directly to the Prime Minister. It is not uh, working under the bu bureaucracy of any government. It has an 18-member board which includes people from the private sector. Uh, it includes people who are experts in their respective disciplines. It also has government rep representatives. There are two federal secretaries, one of education one of si and one of science and technology on the board also. And so it is a blend of public and private sector. And it also has representation of the Senate on it. Uh, so the government is also represented. And all the four provinces are also represented on it. So it is uh, a body which, uh, an 18-member body, which has been trying to deliver. The chairman HEC has zero powers. And this I ensured when I was becoming the chairman and the law was being formulated. I said, well, unfortunately, this country is reaping with corruption. And we, while we want to get a lot of money, it should not go into the hands of uh, the wrong people who may want to seek appointments at such positions where they could make money. So we ensured that the law very clearly states that Higher Education Commission, the chairman of Higher Education Commission has zero powers. And uh, so the financial powers are all vested with the executive director and his team of people. Uh, and uh, we there also introduced a double auditing system within the Higher Education Commission. Normally, government funds are audited by government auditors, uh, so Auditor General of Pakistan would audit. But as you know better than me, that there's a huge amount of corruption in the process of audit. And paras, paragraphs are first made, and then there is negotiation across the table, and, and then money is exchanged to remove those paragraphs. And so what we said, let's have an international company auditing all HEC accounts in addition to the normal government auditors. And so we have a double auditing system with an international system a company auditing our accounts with, where you cannot use such tactics. And uh, I'm happy to say that the chairpersons who have followed me, including Be Begum Shainaz, Wazeridi Saiba, and Dr. Javed Lagari, have more or less maintained the whole policy and the system that I had brought in as the Chairman of Higher Education Commission. The problem has been funding. Uh, the government of Pakistan has severely slashed the budgets. And uh, my resignation in October 2008 was triggered by this cut of budget, of, of cut of the budget, especially the scholarships were not paid to students who were settled in France and in other con countries. Most of them, these students are from poor families and uh, their scholarships were delayed by m more than one and a half months. And then I sent a message to President Asif Ali Zardari at the time that either you support my programs and uh, or you replace me, I'll be happy to resign by a person of your choice. The message that I got was, please resign, which I did immediately and came back to enjoying chemistry in my research institute. And I hope that uh, HEC, uh, a seed that we had sown uh, together with my colleagues, Dr. Swain Nakhvi and others, will continue to grow and uh, bear fruit for the benefit of the students and children of Pakistan for the future.